that uh, commercial that Lester Holt and Joe Biden did for the Democrat Socialist Party. Oh, yeah, that one. I thought it was terrible. Uh, it was not particularly entertaining at all, uh, particularly when uh, Joe Biden couldn't forget, couldn't remember, could forget, couldn't remember uh, which country <laughs> he couldn't unify and which country he could. And there was no way we were ever going to unite Ukraine, I mean, excuse me, Iraq, <laughs> Afghanistan. No mm -hmm. way that was going to happen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, maybe um, not knowing who was where and what uh, matters were pressing is why there was um, a failure, according to uh, military personnel that were interviewed for this forthcoming bigger, better after action report on Afghanistan and the bombing at the airport. Uh, there was not better planning for the evacuation. John Kirby, who is spokesman, press secretary for the Pentagon on Fox News Sunday, explaining that these interviews that have come out that uh, are critical from a military perspective to the civilian personnel, meaning the Biden administration, of the response in Afghanistan, of the evacuation planning in Afghanistan. You know, you have to... Yes, it's important what they're saying, but that's at a tactical level, and we're still working on the after-action report on a strategic level, so you should really hold your powder, not pay too much attention to what the boots on the ground are saying until we get the strategic overview. It sounded like more Pentagon, uh, Pentagon uh, gobbledygook to me. You take a listen. I think we need to keep these documents in perspective. They're basically interview documents that were meant to assist our investigation into the Abbey Gate bombing, which we, of course, unveiled and uh, revealed uh, a couple of weeks ago. So that, that's what the source of these documents are. These people talking to investigators, they didn't think that these documents were going to become public. They weren't talking to reporters. They were talking to investigators who were trying to get at a, a very deadly a, attack. And they were talking about appropriately what they saw there at the airport, uh, what they experienced there in, in Kabul and in Afghanistan in real time. Uh, so they're valuable documents that will be used for a much larger after action review that the Pentagon is conducting right now, and which will take in not just what was happening at the airport, but what was happening over the course of the, the you know, since the Doha agreement was signed in February 2020 and at a larger strategic level. I would also add that, you know, here in Washington, we have been planning for evacuation as far back as April, and there was no effort by Washington, certainly not the National Security Council specifically to slow down the, that planning, to slow down those pre-positioning of forces that we did in the summer, to slow down the actual execution of, of the evacuation. So again, uh, these were documents that uh, assert uh, in, impressions and perspectives, which are very important down at the at the tactical level in real time. Uh, we need to we need to conduct a larger, uh, more strategic level after action review to get at the whole sense of this, and we're doing that. Yeah, of course. Um, I, I find it curious. These documents, the people who were interviewed did never expected their interviews to be made public. Well, that should go to the veracity of what they had to say because they didn't feel the need to be political because they didn't think it would be made public. He's suggesting that the only reason that it's uh, an issue is because it was made public rather than the substance of the comments that those uh, military men and women made to the investigators. For more help in translating John Kirby speak, we're pleased to be joined by Lieutenant Colonel Jim Carafano, VP of the Catherine and Shelby Cullum Davis Institute for International Studies at the Heritage Foundation, author of Brutal War, Jungle Fighting in Papua New Guinea, 1942. Jim, thanks. Appreciate it. Yeah, so the interesting thing to me is, I'm really, and I'm really glad you played that cut, was the just the tone and content of his response. Um, he was nervous, he was frenetic, um, and he obviously had a bunch of talking points that he was spouting out, which, which really suggests this is just clean up on aisle five, right? This yeah. is not about, and, and even actually, uh, you know, his, he, his comments actually suggest, yeah, I now want to report and whitewash and explain away all this stuff. And I thought it was really interesting that we're going back to 2020, which means don't worry, because in the end we'll blame Trump. Right. And but the comments uh, that you're certainly uh, you've certainly been made aware of Washington Post reporting on it, they, they were a pretty significant indictment of what the administration did and didn't do into in the run up to the fall of Kabul, of Kabul. Yeah. And the other thing is, is, remember, President Biden actually came out and said, I reject this report. Yeah. So he hasn't even seen the report yet. Well, it's 2000 pages. Right, I mean, is, do you think he even I, read it? 
No, of course not. And then the, and of course they say, well, it's not done yet, right? But so the president has rejected a report he hasn't even seen. Right. Um, while Kirby's saying, wait but, for the wait for the final product. Right. And look, I mean, look, the, this president, like President Obama, has has no real respect for the men and women armed forces. Um, you know, I've said this before, and you know, God forbid the shooting ever starts in Ukraine. When people ask why there's a crisis in Ukraine. You know, the answer is very simple. It's because Joe Biden is president of the United States. They never tried anything like this under Trump. Biden came in office. He organized and directed one of the worst military operations in modern history. Who thinks that Putin wouldn't challenge him after that? You have a president who is political through the entire Afghan crisis, who's more worried about explaining away his failures than dealing with the crisis. Um, he has an, a, an uncontrolled southern border. He won't even protect America's own interests, uh, and, he, and, he, and he just makes excuses for that. Um, you know, why would not Putin test the president of the United States? And, and let's look at what's happened throughout this Ukraine crisis. It's very, very difficult to say that the president of the United States has been the master and commander here, and he is acting like a leader of the free world. So... Um, I'm, what I'm, they've done with this report is just, and this kind of fuels the distrust uh, and questioning the leadership of this president when they can't even man up on their own mistakes. On the matter of Ukraine, you had uh, the Ukrainian ambassador to the UK say that uh, basically Ukraine is open-minded to not pursuing joining NATO if that would prevent mo prevent war, which means abandoning a goal written into. Ukraine's constitution. Right. Um, so so I, I just was thinking about this. It's not a perfect uh, analogy, but I want to get your take on it, see how imperfect it is. Um, is. Is Putin playing Biden the way that Hitler played uh, Neville Chamberlain over Sudetenland in the run-up to World War II? So we don't know, right? Because, because we don't know. It, what we do know now, right, is that Hitler was going to invade deal or no. What, what Chamberlain did was basically give Hitler something for nothing. Hitler was going to take the Sudetenland, and he was not going to stop there. Uh, so what Chamberlain did was he gave away the Sudetenland. And, and actually, it would have been riskier for Hitler to actually invade, because there were, there were people, if it, if it had gone badly, and, and there, were, there were people that, that, that were opposing Hitler inside, it might have actually created some internal dissent. But 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 here's what we don't know. We don't know if, if Putin is going to invade regardless or not, and if whatever people sign away, he'll just pocket and move on to the next thing. Here, here's what I will say, is saying that, well, we won't join NATO. This is not about Ukraine joining NATO. Lots of countries have joined NATO. I mean, one of them was 900 miles away, and the, and the Russians were complaining about that. Russians have more troops and nuclear weapons on their border than anybody. This isn't even about Ukraine. This is about Hitler's long-term strategic goal, which is not only reabsorbing the Soviet states, but but have dictatorial control over cent Central Europe. Putin's, at some point Putin's, yeah. in the last decade, Putin, sorry, at some point in the last decade, Putin just decided that that the West was never going to be whole, free, secure, and prosperous, and that that this this was a skeleton to pick over. And and now he's decided that's what he's going to try to do. So, if you're an American living in Ukraine, should you get out now? Should you heed the warning of Jake Sullivan and President Biden? Well, look, I don't. Have, I have very little faith in this in this government. Um, I, I I don't know why. You, you, that's a difficult question to answer because I don't know why you're, you're there and what you're doing. I mean, if you're a tourist in Ukraine, is that the smartest thing to do? No. Um, I, I, Dolan Peterson's a, a a very good friend of mine. Um, he's an American citizen. He's married to Ukrainian women. He's a he's a combat war reporter. You know, I don't think he's going to run away. So uh, we'll see. What do you make of this uh, letter that was made public by a uh, retired Russian general, Leonid Ivashov, and others uh, essentially calling on um, the, well, calling on Putin to resign because uh, an unprovoked, unprovoked invasion would have tens of thousands of casualties and turn Russia into an international pariah? And he believes threatens Russia's very existence. At least that's what he says. Um, is that uh, is that a substantial event? Uh, the open criticism of uh, Putin from within the ranks of Russian military. 
I, I wouldn't say it's substantial, but but I I do think it is. You know, this has to be part of Putin's calculus. Right? What happens if you invade and everything doesn't go incredibly well? Um, how? I don't think I don't think there's a, a scenario where his in the short term where his uh, rule is threatened. Um, but if he invades and it doesn't really go well and it bogs down uh, and 44 million people really fight back and the body bags are coming home, uh, I, I do think that's a stressor on on Russia. And this is kind of where the Chinese Russian relationship gets really interesting. The, you know, the Chinese are all in and they're cheerleading and you go, boy. Um, the question is, is what happens when things turn ugly? Will the Chinese actually, um, you know, stand up for the Russians? Will, will the Chinese bail them out? Will the Chinese give them money? Or, you know, will the Chinese say, okay, well, here's some money to help keep fighting your war. Why don't you give us Manchuria? You know, so, you know, how strong a friend really are the Chinese? And so that's how much can Putin really count on them? So so these are things that, that he has to consider as well. And, and much, you know, look, I mean, much like... Uh, uh, you know, any, you know, leader, we don't know what's going on inside his head. And, and this is the problem, right? With everything Biden has done, I mean, not just the, the failure and provoking this, everything else, but how he's responded to this crisis. You know, I was only on the army for 25 years. So I've been doing this my whole life, but when you're fighting with somebody or competing with them or standing off with them, trying to deter them, the last thing you want to do is set the table. So they get to make all the choices and you're just reacting to them. And everything Biden has done, which, by the way, is exactly the way Obama would handle a crisis, which is they would set up a situation and they would leave all the initiative to the other side. I mean, we're all talking about Ukraine and Afghanistan. Nobody's talking about the Iran deal. Look what they're doing with the Iran deal. They literally have admitted that they cannot craft an Iran deal that will stop Iran from getting a nuclear weapon, yet they are still deeply engaged in this deal. And they've got the Russians negotiating for them. And the deal they're going to do is... We're going to give Iran everything it wants and hope that because that we have done that, yeah. they'll be nice to us and not a, build a bomb. Appeasement always works with mm-hmm. uh, uh, these sorts. Uh, wh- why is this different? If if Putin were to try to take the Donbass region, just eastern Ukraine, uh, where there's some uh, Russian connection population, why is this uh, different than Crimea or Georgia? Well, it's not. Um, I think the difference here is is we have such a big dramatic buildup that it, it it's getting much more difficult to conceptualize something between an all-out war and nothing. That you know, Ukraine at this point, if the Russians did even a small incursion, the Ukrainians would have to fight back, and that would quickly escalate into a larger war. And so, and this, this kind of gets to the point is if all you wanted was the Donbass. Um, and maybe you could pressure them to give it to you or whatever, but uh, why wouldn't you just grab it? Because you'd grab it and be over with, right? So but when you allow the entire world to watch and all this stuff and build up, it's very, very difficult to avoid the larger work. But here's what I would say. Look, it doesn't matter. I mean, it matters to 44 Ukrainians. One thing people have to understand is no matter what happens, it's not over. If Putin does nothing... The threat is not over. If Putin just takes a piece of Ukraine, the threat. If he takes the whole country, it it doesn't end because that's not the end of his goal. So that's why I wrote you know this piece and it's in this thing 1945 where I said, look, what checkmates Putin and doesn't make him a threat? And and it's largely strategic and conventional deterrence. The notion that he cannot break into the transatlantic community and fight them and win, and it's energy independence for the United States, energy security for Europe. They know you can't threaten them with the energy weapon. You take those two things off the table, he has nothing, nothing. He's a speak, joke. Speak, yeah, speaking so we have of, to do those two things regardless. Speaking of checkmate, uh, Gary Kasparov, uh, writing in the New York Daily News, uh, says that uh, Putin isn't a chess player. He's a gambler and a bluffer. And he's uh, betting that the West will do nothing. And what he's suggesting the West do, because Putin wouldn't doesn't anticipate this, is uh, assuming he does not invade uh, Ukraine, move with those significant sanctions on him and his 
oligarchic cohorts anyway, start drying up their money, start uh, hampering Russia's ability to be economically viable, regardless of what Putin does, to sort of flip the tables and start operating from that position of strength. What do you think of that? Well, yeah, I mean, I think that's right. I mean, my great fear, my great fear, look, my number one thing is I don't want to see four, the lives of 44 million people put at risk. But one of the things is, is if he doesn't invade, I'm afraid that people will say, okay, dodge the bullet there. This is all, let's just go back to business as usual, which is making NATO less of a deterrent, um, undermining energy independence, um, allowing Russia to get stronger, allowing Russia and China to coordinate more against us. Um, so if we dodge a bullet, the last, the last thing we should say is dodge a bullet. And then, hey, make no mistake, you know, when people go back and say, well, Chamberlain signed this, but he bought us time, that is complete nonsense. Yeah. Chamberlain signed that document, and he went home and did nothing. And, and there was no good accelerated preparations to, to take on the Germans. That's just myth, right? So the, Putin, regardless of what happens in the Ukraine, Putin is a threat. And the number one beneficiary of that threat is China, because Russia and China want the same thing. They want to divide it and weaken Western Europe. The, the Russians are doing the Chinese work for them. And this notion that somehow, you know, we can't be tough on Russia because we have to focus on China. Dude, it's the same problem. And if we can't be America and stand up and defend ourselves and our interests, then, then we're going to get exactly what people that, that don't protect their own interests get. To be able to take their stuff away from them. Lieutenant Colonel Jim Carafano, VP of the Catherine Shelby Cullum Davis Institute for International Studies at the Heritage mm-hmm. Foundation. The book, Brutal War, Jungle Fighting in Papua New Guinea, 1942. Thanks, Jim. And he joined us on our turnkey.pro answer line. Hear about the big stories of the day. Then talk about them right here on Chicago's Morning Answer on AM 560. The Answer. Spills happen every day in your workplace, anywhere gasoline, diesel, machine, crude, or cooking oils are used. These spills not only disrupt workflow. 